countries to lie on the earth. It is. Do you understand that, sir? I do. Uh, thank you very much, sir. You are called here today uh, to mainly testify about the events of April 10th and 11th and the other events that, that are associated with it. Are you ready to talk about them? I'm ready and willing. Uh, thank you, sir. In order to avoid leaning forward when you respond to my questions, kindly draw the microphone closer to you so that uh, you can sit comfortably and would not need to be leaning forward as you respond to my questions. And thank you very much, sir. Um, what are your full names? My name is Zephaniah Beresford King but better known as Rex King. And what is your date of birth, Mr. King? I was born on the 2nd of October, 1947. Where were you born? In Bathurst, now Banjul. And uh, where did you go to school? I attended the Methodist Preparatory and the Gambia High School. <coughs> uh, and what did you do? upon completion of high school? Upon completion of high school, I was employed by the Gamba government at the establishment office, now PMO, and after a very short while, transferred to the Customs and Excise Department, following upon which I was appointed as cadet fire stroke police officer on the 1st of June, 1968. Did I hear you say fire stroke police officer? Yes, please. Uh, so, in a sense, you're suggesting that uh, you joined an organization or an entity that had responsibility for both policing and for fire service, correct? Yeah, the basic reason being that at that time and in those days, the commission of police then, there was no IG then, the commission of police was also the chief fire officer. Uh, great. So uh, when you joined the organization, what was it called at the time? Was it Gambia Police Force or Gambia Police and Fire Service? What was it called? <laughs> um, uh, I think it was called the Gambia Fire Services. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, could you tell us when you joined? Yes, I said on the 1st of June, 1968. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I'm looking to my right, <laughs> knowing fully well that that must have been a very long time ago. <laughs> yeah, we thank God. So, um, uh, so and can you g uh, give us a brief rundown of your career progression within the force or the service? Yes, I attended local courses here, basically at the uh, police training school. Unfortunately for me, all the guys who I was with in those days and who used to lecture me in the presence of people like Mr. Chongan, Mr. Lees, Mr. Ndir, they all have passed away. May their souls rest in peace. Amen. And then I had training in the UK, attended school in, Stan in, in Stansted, then also in, Bram in Bramley School of Ammunition, also in Derby, and also the Fire Service Technical College, and also at the School of Ammunition, where we did advanced explosive ordnance disposal and improvised explosive devices. Uh, what is the highest position you have attained at the Gambia Fire Service? Chief Fire Officer. Uh, how did did you at any point leave that position of chief fire officer to take up another position? Well, I was appointed as IG of police in June 1999. By IG of police, what do you mean? Inspector General of Police. In June 1989? 99. 99, excuse me. I'm just making it 10 years earlier. <laughs> 
So, so, so tell us, how did it happen? You were a chief fire officer. You became IGP. How did that happen? Can I answer that? I doubt it. <laughs> uh, you should be able to tell us your own perspectives about what happened. Well, I can tell you, as a matter of fact, that when I got a call from the PMO that I had a letter to be collected, I said, why can't they send it over to me? And they said I had to come, come myself. I went over and picked it up. And when I opened it, I realized that I was appointed IG of police. And I said to, I don't know now who was P.S. Pilmo at the time, I said to him, do I have a choice? He said, what do I mean? I said, well, can I say yes or no to this? He said, oh, no, no, you cannot say no to this. I said, why? He said, this is an executive appointment. I said, is that so? So I said, okay, thank you. So I decided to go to the then Secretary General, who was the late, I think, Thompson Bay, I think, Thompson Bay. And I told him, I said, look, I've just received a letter from the PMO appointing me as IG of police. Who, who appointed you as IG of police? Well, normally it's the PSC who writes to you, but of course I think it's the uh, head of state himself, maybe who has influence over that, that I cannot swear upon. In fact, isn't the IGP appointed by the president under the constitution? I know uh, he has a hand in it, I know that. But you, you can't recall. You no, I, I, I cannot tell you. But what I did say to Mr. Mbai was that I was in very comfortable accepting that position because I believe it has political undertones. He said to me, no, 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 no. What we understand here is that you are, you are very strict, you are very firm, and in fact in all the security services, yours is the best in terms of discipline, all, the, do all those kinds of jargons. So I said, so I don't have a chance. I cannot say yes or no to this. He said, no, you cannot say no to this in any case. So I went back, and the following uh, morning, I think it was, I went back to him, and I said to him, look, I have slept him over who? this man to, to Mr. Who? Mbai. Mr. Mbai. I went back to him, I said, look, I slept over this matter, but I am still not comfortable because of the political undertones that I know goes along with it. He said to me, no, don't worry. I know you won't have any problem because I know you. You don't talk politics. I said, of course I don't talk politics. So he said, if I were you, just accept it and just do your job. I said, okay. So I went back. I so tell essentially, you, for, you accepted the yes. position. So I went back. And after... Do you have to write to indicate acceptance of the offer? Yes, but I didn't do it immediately. I didn't do it immediately. How long did it take you? About a week. About a week, I think. But within that period, did you assume the job? No. I was in my office, and my predecessor was in his office, and he would call me nearly every day. You don't want to take over? I said, I'm coming. I'm handing over, you know. Who's your, who was your predecessor? Uh, Mr. Pasalajain. Pasalajain. Okay. But this they, they was call, in 1989. I beg your pardon? 1999. Yes, please. This was Pasalajain. This yes. was his second coming as IGP. Yes. Okay. Good. So, um, uh, so you eventually take, took up the job? Yes, or, uh, over a week. Because all I needed to do was to change my rank markings because I already had my uniform. So it should not have taken that long if I wanted to. So eventually, I went over, did the handing and taking over. And I remember Tam Sirjase saying to me, uh, you don't want to come over. And you're not even putting on uniform. I say, yes, I was thinking about it, but next week I'll come in uniform. And eventually I, I came over and I started my work. And uh, you, your initial idea was that this job was mired in politics. Well, it had undertones, undoubtedly. Yeah. Uh, what was the situation in the first few months when you took up the job? Yes, the very first few months, I seemed to have some, li to have had some liberty, and I was doing my work, and I had no problems. Yes, I remember that. And uh, within a year, 
almost just before a year into this job as IGP, certain problems of national interest occurred in which the police had uh, certain responsibilities. Uh, I am referring specifically to the death uh, of uh, Ibrahim Abari and the alleged rape of Ebin Tamane. Do you remember these events? Yes, but I think before you get into that, if you don't mind, uh, let me just say a few things. Please go ahead. You did ask me whether the first few months whether I was getting on smoothly with work. Yes, I was. But when I took over, perhaps my style of management was different and maybe not what was expected of me. Because what are you referring to? The, one of the first things I did I was because I realized that the opposition political parties were not getting on very well with the police. I thought I wanted to correct that. So I invited uh, the head of the UDP then, who I think he's still, Mr. Usain Dabo, to my office. I thought he was going to come, maybe him and somebody else alone, but he came with a very, very large delegation, including the present speaker, late Femi, Femi Peters, Shingul Nyasi. About some eight, nine people came to my office. In fact, we laughed over it. I said, ah, what, you've come to invade my office? And we laughed over it. So I said to him, look, Hussein, I have known you long before you became a politician, and you also uh, have known me long before I came, became IG. I am calling you because I realize that you we are not getting on very well with the police vis-a-vis -vis the head of the police and uh, by, by, by extension the government. What I want you to do for me is I want to assure you first of all that this question of refusing your permits to hold your meetings has come to an end. Anytime you want to hold your meeting, right, let me know and I can assure you that if, the, if it's good cause, you'll hold your meeting with no hindrance. And we chatted over so many things, chatted, 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 and each of them asked me questions. And f to all intents and purposes, I think they left my office feeling very happy. And we shook hands, hugged each other, all of them, and then they left. The next thing I did was I invited Mr. Ahmad Bah. And he was heading the NRP, NRP I think it was. And he too came. And I spoke on similar lines because he too I knew when he used to work for Novotel. And I remember he used to have issues. I think he was there, either human resource manager or something on those lines. And he used to have some issues and I used to solve them for him. So as soon as he came, he said to me, hey, my brother, I'm happy that you are here. When we hugged each other, I said, now sit. But with all this, I wasn't doing it alone. I had my deputy and the police advisor and some officers with me when I was doing all these things, so that it's no secret. And uh, we spoke like I spoke to Usain Odabo, and he too promised me that as long as I was the one there, he can assure me that they were not going to do anything that would be against the law, they will behave, they will this, they will that. And again, he too left feeling very happy. But of course, in those days, uh, you can be sure that anything you say now, now, the next minute, it's, it's over at the presidency. And I knew it, so I wasn't bothered with that, you know. And then I said to my deputy, you know, I have called the opposition parties. What I want you to do is to, since you people are the APRC people, you better tell the, uh, the Minister of the Interior, who is their representative in government, that I am saying I was looking through the files, but I did not see anywhere where they have applied for permit to operate or to hold their meetings. He said, hey, boss. I said, tell him. That, that's what I observe. But he didn't come back with me with a message. So, but as far as I was concerned, that matter was over. But did I am did you invite the APRC? No, 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 I did not. Did you invite any other political party apart from these two? No, I did not. UDP and NRP? No, I did not. Why did you omit the other political parties? No, those were small parties by me, and they didn't have issues. They, they had no issues. The issues that I realized was there was that of between the government and UDP or government and NRP. So the other ones had no issues really. There was no issue with the PDOIS? Not, not, not as far as I, I, I was aware. No. 
and you did not think it was necessary in order to ensure that uh, all political parties are put on the no, same they, footing they had, they had by no inviting the PDOIS? They had no problems. And whilst during my tenure, I made sure that when they applied for permits to operate, they did have their permits. Uh, during this period, before the events of March 2000, um, did you experience anything in the job that had political connotations or political problems? Uh, in what sense? In any sense, really. Did you encounter any political interference in the in the execution of your functions, or did you encounter any problem of a political nature which you had to address as IGP? Not that I'm aware of. Good. So tell us uh, about the, okay, up to March 2000, what was the relationship between you and as IGP and State House? Ah, okay. I think uh, what I probably need to, need to mention here was a few months after I took over as IG, there was a morning when H.G. called me to say he wanted to see me. Who do you mean when you say The H. president. So Who I, was he at the time? Uh, Yaya Jame. I went over and I was welcome and I sat and he said to me, Oh, how are you doing with your job? How is this? How is that? The usual courtesies. And I said, oh, fine. I'm doing fine. And he said to me, you know, you are a very disciplined man and very strong. <laughs> so I said to myself, what's the catch? You know? So he said to me, you know what I want you to do? I said, no, unless you say so. He said to me, I want you to dismiss 14 police officers. I said, 14? And who are they and what have they done? He said to me, well, you know, it was political. I told your predecessor to dismiss them. But he delidalled, that's what he used. He delidalled until he left and he didn't do it. And then I said to him, but if you told my predecessor to dismiss 14 officers and he did not do it until he left, I don't think I'm going to dismiss them. I said, because as far as I'm concerned, they have done nothing wrong during my tenure. So I don't think I can do that. So he said to me, yeah, but just go ahead. I say, no, I will not go ahead. I cannot dismiss them. They have not done anything wrong as far as I'm concerned. And then he said to me, okay, you can go and just write their names on a piece of paper and send it to me. I will do it. I say, but <laughs> if I go and write their names down to you, I don't even know who they are in the first place. I will have to go and ask. And if I go and ask for their names and they give them to me and I send it to you, I'll be unfair to my conscience. I, I am sorry. I cannot do this one. And then he said to me, ah, so you will not do it? I say, no, I will not do it. I say, okay. If that's the way you are going to behave, I will not give you instructions anymore. I said, as it pleases your excellency. You are on the oath. I'm telling you. This is a conversation you had with, with ex-president yeah. uh, Jame. Yes. You told him to his face. I told him that I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> Maybe you don't know me enough. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, 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 I just... I'm just helping you bring out your evidence. Uh, yeah, well, I'm telling and, you. Uh, and that's all, that's all I would do. Yeah. I just want to put the punches uh, where they should yeah. be and the commas where they should be. Yes, you I told Yaya Jame to his face that you were not going to implement his own order. I don't know whether I, don't know I told him to his face, but I told him I wasn't going to do it. And then he reacted yeah, by yeah. saying... Yeah. yeah, I don't think I'm going to give instructions anymore. I said, as it pleases your excellency. And uh, what happened after that? And I am that? sure that didn't go down very well. He didn't say anything on those lines, but, I, I, but in my, within my conscience, I thought I would have to pay for those things. And I was ready for that, to tell you the truth. Now, soon after that, because I was still doing my familiarization tour of the different sections in the police. So this event happened? Well uh, before the April. Yes, but not long after your appointment as I Oh, yes, a few months, yeah. And... Uh, I went around and I went to one of the offices and I realized that there was an officer who I wasn't seeing. So I said to the officer in charge, where is Mr. Sambu? And he said to me, hey, that one, he doesn't come to work here. 
I said, he doesn't come to work here. What do you mean by that? He said to me, he's always at State House. I said, State House doing what? He said, ah, that's where he goes the, every day. He doesn't come here at all. So I said, but who pays him his monthly salary? He said, police. Who provides the material that he uses to do his work? He said, police. The things he does, when he's through with them, who, who does he take them to? He said, State House. I said, and the police is providing this thing and you're paying him? And what have you done about, done about this? I said, I turned to my deputy and said, you know something, today is Friday. I want him to come to work on Monday. Report here. I said, all right, sir. I came to work on Monday, and uh, after having done what I wanted to do, I took a walk around and went down to the office. And I said, has this man come to work? Sir, he didn't come. I said, he didn't come, and what did he do about it? I said, you know what? Do what is right and what, I'm, what we are supposed to do. I want something done this week. I say, you want me to tell you what to do? Put him on charge. If you don't put him on charge, then I'll have a problem with you. And indeed, they put him on charge, and he came for early room. And to tell you the truth, I knew exactly what was going to happen. He took the early room, and uh, at the end of the day, he found him guilty. And, but then what did, he, what did he do? He referred him to the IG for punishment, which I expected. Who was the DIG at the time? Sankung Baje. So he, he was him. Deputy Inspector General yeah. of police at the time. He referred him to me for punishment, which I expected, because I knew they have, what, they have a police language that they call pull, pull head. You know, you take it out and give it to somebody else, you know. So I was expecting that. So on the day when I was supposed to take his early room, he came to my office, the march him in, and I presented the usual questions. You have been charged for this, that, and the other, and you have been found guilty and referred to me for punishment. But before I go into that, what is your plea in my office? He said he was guilty. I said, so you are guilty of the fact that you've not been coming to work for the past one year and so months? He said, yes, sir. I said, why? He said, because he used to go to a state house. I said, who posted you there? He said, well, he posted himself there posted yourself there. So I said to him, now, let's turn the tables around. I'm being very honest with you. I said, let's turn the tables around. I am you and you are me. If you were the IG and I did this to you, what will you do to me? And he, and he said to me, sir, really and truly, if I was the IG, I will dismiss you. I said, if you're IG, you'll dismiss me. He said, yes, sir. I said, well, in that case, I will do that. I said, you are suggesting that to me, not so. Well, you are dismissed. And then I, I, I dismissed him immediately. And he was a sub-inspector. I dismissed him immediately. Again, I knew that that message will go over. But then to, I got to where? To we'll state go house. To, to, state, to state house, of course. So then I started having rumors. Rumor. Uh, in all of boss, guy in yo, yang <laughs> Could you say that in, in, in English? <laughs> say, you are, you, are, you are driving the jewelers from the job. I said, sacking the jewelers. Sacking the jewelers, yes. I said, it's not a jeweler business. This is, I'm going straight. I said, and it's, this is a warning for everybody else, you know, who is here, to, to know that me, I'm not here for jeweler or manjago or serial. I'm here to get a job done. And what? anybody who doesn't want to work, please leave, or else you part company with me. Those statements, how did you understand them? Both. Uh, what did you understand that? What was the message being conveyed? I have to be careful, that's all. That's what it meant. Be careful of whatever. Careful of what? What came to mind that maybe you had my, to be careful maybe, about? Maybe my life or something will happen to me. It didn't come out in such plain language. I tell you something, uh, Mr. Fall. Uh, in those days, if the president of the didn't succeed in doing anything, he succeeded in putting fear in the people. Were you afraid? No. I, I'm telling you that he succeeded in putting fear because in those days people do this. When they go, they look around they over their shoulders. Me, I am sitting here talking to you today by the grace of God. What do you mean by that? Can you explain? Anything could have happened to me. Anything. Did you do anything that suggests anything yeah, that could have happened the, to the you? The line of action that I was taking for the good of the country and the good of the police it was not the usual thing. It was not what they were used to. Do you give us another example? <laughs> like what? 
apart from sacking this guy because he deserved to be sacked, he wasn't coming to work, and uh, the fact that you openly defied Jame in his office by telling him that you're not going to implement his instructions, give us another example. Well, I'm not sure whether these are examples, but what I did not do, which others were doing, all the heads of the security services would go to State House most evenings, go and drink this green tea, eat Afra. I've never, not once, never. Never been to State House? In the evenings also to go and drink attire, uh, this uh, green tea? Never. To hang out? Gossip? Never. Hang out for what? Gossip? <laughs> no. Yeah, so I'm sure I, I keep saying you don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> well, explain yourself to the Gambian uh, people. Let them know you. Maybe, 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 uh, if, maybe if they were drinking beer, maybe I'll go and drink some beer, but not to go and drink attire, you know. <laughs> Who, you see, you never went to find out. Maybe they even drank uh, more than beer. Uh, I'm, I'm only teasing you now. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you don't smoke. Maybe they were smoking something. No, I don't smoke either. Okay, good. So tell us about... March 2000, when you first received these reports about the death of a student and the rape of another, alleged rape of another student. Tell us about those events. Yes, when I got information that uh, uh, some, a student in Brikama called Ibrahim uh, Bari, what's he called Bari? Yes, proceed, sir. When, when I got information that he died in Br Brikama, following up on uh, fire officers giving him cement to eat, because that's what the, uh, that's the report that we received at the time, that he was given cement to eat. I, I, I inquired, and they said he had some issues with his teachers and things like that, and they took him to the fire station in Brikama because one of the officers who was there was his relative. So I said, but the fire station is not a police station. Why should they take somebody to the fire station for that? So I immediately got onto my DIG to get onto the CMC for them to launch an investigation into the matter. And an inquiry was open, and the matter was being dealt with. And of course, uh, a post-mortem was carried out. And uh, at the end of the day, the reports we got was that he did not, they did not see any trace of cement uh, in his system and that he died of uh, respiratory failure. So I said, well, let them look into the matter properly, and of course the, the case file has to be sent over to AG's chambers, because under normal circumstances, they will be the ones who will handle those kinds of cases, not the police. And uh, I told them to carry on with that and make a follow-up. This was done, and eventually the case file was sent to AG's chambers. At the time, the DPP was a lady from Sierra Leone, Mrs. Something, Atiba, I think Atiba Davis, something like that. Gloria Atiba Davis. Yes, Gloria Atiba Davis, that's the name, yes. And I used to call her from time to time. How is this case progressing? I said, because this, this is a case that I want to be dealt with expeditiously. And one day he said to me, IG, I said, yes, uh, Madam DPP, he said to me, this case for want of evidence. I am not sure whether we have a good case to present her. Huh? So I said, but uh, if there is a case to be answered, take the, take the culprits to court. I said, but let us also remember that the people who are being accused to have their rights. So let us not just take advantage of the fact that, well, a student has died and therefore but by whatever means they must be prosecuted. I said, let, let us do it judiciously. As far as you know, was there any political interference with regards to that case? Uh, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. All right. And, uh, and to the best of your knowledge, the case was proceeded with accordingly. Yes, the case was taken to court. Actually, during the later period before the case was taken to court, I had to travel to Vienna because I used to be the Gambian representative uh, who were looking into the reforms that were to be made for the illegal uh, transportation and, uh, of women and children. So I was the Gambian rep 
So I had to go and attend that meeting. And when I came back, I found out that the firemen had been uh, arrested and remanded in custody. I asked my deputy, uh, what happened with that case? Oh, yes. Uh, we had instructions from the minister that they should be charged and taken to court. I said, oh, is that, has, is that what happened? Did he say which minister? Uh, interior, of course. Say again, sir? The interior minister. And who was he at the time? Mr. Usman Baji. Was that normal? Well, it is not the normal procedure. It is not the normal procedure. So I said to him, so we, are you happy with that? He said, ah, boss. He's the minister. So I said, okay, that's all right. Okay, that's all right. They were taken to court, and the case took some time. And the long and short of that case is that for lack of proper evidence, I think they were uh, acquitted and discharged. And when that happened, Mrs. Atiba Davis definitely called me and said to me, I told you that we did not have uh, enough evidence to secure conviction. But perhaps before this case was concluded. Uh, did you receive any demands from the students uh, requesting that justice be done with regards to that particular case? Well, the justice to be done that I would want to believe is what they were talking about was that for the whoever, who, whoever was involved to, to be prosecuted. And for me, that was done. But, uh, the demands you were receiving from the students, was it before actual prosecutions t took place or was it during the course of those prosecutions? Oh, mainly, mainly before. Mainly before. Mainly before yeah. And at the same time, too, there were allegations of a young girl who was allegedly raped. Yes. Uh, Could you tell us about that? Yeah, what was her name again? Um, You can assist me with the name. I forgot the name now. Bintamani. Bintamani, yeah, that's it. Bintamani, yes. Yeah, there was some activity at the stadium, and it, it was alleged that uh, some officer from the PIU had raped a lady. Again, I got onto my DIG to get onto the CMC for them to mount up an investigation immediately, which was done, and there was a follow-up. And uh, every day I come to work, I will inquire, how is this case progressing? And they will tell me that they have done this, they have done that. I said, but have you been able to pinpoint anybody who was in the surrounding? And I asked them to contact the uh, OC commanding uh, the PIU to detail and tell us who we are deployed around the stadium and who, who, and who was on duty on that day. They did all those things, and eventually they were able to get some of the officers who they said were around the stadium at the time, and an ID parade was uh, conducted. Unfortunately, from what I got, in fact, this was conducted in the compound of the police headquarters. The lady wasn't able to identify the proper person because all the ones, he, I think they did it three times, and all the persons that uh, she identified were certainly not the people who involved in that. They could, in fact, two or three of them that he, she identified we are not, not people who are not even in the vicinity on that day. So in the absence of being able to identify the victim, we could not proceed with that case. Uh, in the meantime, students were making demands for justice for these two cases. Yeah. Did you participate in any discussions with students about this? What those... Uh, those, my participation with the students was before the demonstration. Before, it wasn't after. It's what I'm referring to. Sorry. Yes, I had calls to go to Gambia College together with uh, the CMC, uh, Tatin Baji, no, land, Landing Baji, normally called Sankung Baji. I went with him. And landing I, Baji, normally called? Tatin. Okay. Tatin Baji. Okay. I went with him and I think one other officer and the minister was also present. Uh, minister, are you minister referring? of the interior. Name, please. Uh, Usman Baji. And uh, he spoke before me. And after he had finished speaking, I said to the students, look, I would rather you apply for a permit. And I am giving you the guarantee as the IG that I will give you permission 
to demonstrate. The reason being that I will give you police escort so that if the demonstration gets out of hand, we'll be able to assist you. Because if it does get out of hand and you are on your own, maybe you will not be able to manage it. And they said, well, they were not going to apply for a permit. I said, well, if you're not going to apply for a permit and you go and demonstrate and something comes out of it, you will bear the responsibility, you know. And they say, yes. I said, I would urge you not to demonstrate without having written to me so that I'll be aware and I can provide you with police protection. And once I finished talking, I, I left the campus and came back to Banjul. Uh, let me read out to you the account of the students mm -hmm. who participated in that meeting and tell us uh, your take on it. Uh, uh, one of the witnesses who was present said, on Friday, 24th March, in the morning, the SOS Interior, IGP, and Deputy Inspector General of Police came to college, uh, and a meeting was called at the computer lab with student leaders, chaired by the vice principal of the college, Dr. Bojan. I considered the meeting not an engagement for dialogue, but an attempt to threaten the student folks. The remarks were very harsh and threatening. They warned that if anybody demonstrates again, you will be dealt with accordingly, and that the security of the country will not be compromised. The students maintained their position in calling for justice. Does that accurately describe what happened in that meeting? No, and that is not correct. As far as I'm concerned, that's not correct. Ah. If, if, I, if, I, if I spoke to them, I only told them what I've just told you. I encouraged them to apply, and I will give them police protection. I said that. What if they did not apply? What would you do? I, that's what I said. I said, if they don't apply, and they go on their own, and it gets out of hand, they may not be able to manage it, and then they will bear the responsibility. Do you threaten them? No. I don't call that a threat. I told them the hard fact. Did you tell them uh, that if anybody demonstrates, they would be dealt with accordingly and that the security of the country will not be compromised? No, I didn't speak in that language, no. How about the minister? I don't know what he could have said, but I didn't say that anyway. Do you remember anybody saying something like that? Not at that meeting. Uh, did you hold another meeting with the students apart from this one? Yes, that is correct. Could you tell us about that? Yes, this was a subsequent meeting held at the police headquarters. Uh, I, in, uh, w w I invited them to come again so that we can still talk over this matter to avert any possible problem. And uh, they came. And on that day, I remember the president was supposed to travel. And I got them seated in the conference room. And I came in. And I was addressing them. And I still pleaded with them not to demonstrate in the absence of an application to hold their demonstration. But of course, they were quite adamant. And they said whether they had permission to demonstrate or not, they were going to demonstrate. There was push and pull, push and pull. And in the meantime, time was running out because the system in place, which is still in place, is such that if the president is traveling, the security heads see him off at the airport. And when I realized that I had only something like 15, 20 minutes to be at the airport to witness the president's departure, I told my deputy to take over the meeting and to report to me when I come back. And, and I left and went to the airport. And uh, during that meeting, your suggestion is that the students, uh, the students um, uh, insisted that they will demonstrate without a permit. 
That's yeah, your with, suggestion? With or without a permit, yes. Did they say whether they would apply for a permit? No, they didn't tell me that. Not in my presence, anyway. Uh, we have another different take about what happened at the meeting. In the first instance, you claim that no threats were issued to the students as far as you know. By me, no. So your suggestion is that it would be a lie to suggest that you threatened them during that meeting at Gambia College, correct? That is not true. Uh, what would you say to the suggestion that they were threatened by the SOS for interior during that meeting? Uh, I cannot speak for him, but I, I'm not sure whether he threatened them, but maybe he, could, he, he, he would be in a better position to say. But from your own recollection, was there a threat issued to the students? Well, you see, when they say a threat, it can be relative. Maybe somebody's tone of talking can be considered a threat. As I say, I cannot speak for him. Let, let him speak for himself. The question is, you're not speaking for him. We're talking about your own recollection of things. Was there a threat or uh, was there no threat? No, I wouldn't be able to comment on that. I don't know. Well, not being able to call comment on it, not being willing to comment on it, is different from not knowing what I'm not, happened. I'm not, uh, I'm not unwilling. It's just that I cannot, uh, at this point in time, tell you that, yes, he threatened them. That would be unfair for me to say. I will not say so. And why is that? Why are you unable to say it? Is it because of lack of knowledge or unwillingness? Lack of knowledge, maybe, not unwillingness. Well, let's be definitive. Uh, let's speak in absolute terms. Are you unable to say because you had no knowledge, or are you unable to say because you are unwilling to say? No, I'm not unwilling. I, I told you that I will come here and I will speak the truth to you, and that's exactly what I'm doing. To say that he threatened them, if I say so, I'll be unfair, and I want to be fair. So as far as you can recall, you did not hear the SOS interior issue any threat, correct? No. All right, so uh, this is uh, from a different witness. Uh, hold a second, let me read it. He says, on our arrival at the college, we found all top senior security personnel filled in the college, and many senior security officers were all there ranging from the commissioner, IGP, NIA, and many other government institutions, top-ranking officials. We were invited to the office of the principal of the college, where we found all these senior officers. They all asked our reasons for embarking on the strike, and Aliu Khan explained our frustrations about all that was happening. And I was also given the opportunity to give my report on our investigations in making sure that we acted responsibly, responsibly to gather all necessary information regarding Ibrahim's death, which was no longer rumor, but facts at hand. We gathered, and I registered my frustration and disappointment of even involving Birkama Police Station uh, by providing us with a CID officer. And even after providing these three witness statements, nothing was done. I asked, what do they expect us to do after taking all these necessary steps and nothing has been done about it? After my statement, it was only Landing Baji, Alaya Statin Baji, who came out clearly and said we were not wrong in the steps we took and requested for a copy of the post-mortem and handed it over to me. He said that's where it starts and they will work in collaboration with us on the investigation in order to ensure justice is done. We were relieved, and uh, he also expressed their frustration about the damages the strike caused to fire station and equipment. We assured them that uh, we will not sit back uh, and that the following day we will embark on a sensitization seminar in Birkama about, about this person's death. Uh, so from what is stated in here, 
it's only 13 Baji who gave them assurance. Who gave them assurance of what was going to happen? And the others did not. What do you say to that? He, he may have said what you said to them, but I do know that I was the one who was liaising between the DIG and Sankung Baji, who was the CMC at the time. How about the next meeting at your office, at your offices? At the conference room. At the conference room. Were the students threatened or were they not threatened? Not whilst I was there. Because like I said to you, I tried to encourage them to apply for a permit before I left for the airport. As far as you know, did the students apply for a permit at all? Not that I am aware of. Uh, here, we have in the record of the Commission of Enquiry that was instituted after the events uh, of April 10, 11, uh, 2000, a handwritten request addressed to you for a permit. I will send it over to you so that you can take a look at it. Uh, it is uh, Exhibit 10 of Exhibit 83. Uh, it is uh, page 175 of the report, and it was addressed to you. Um, in all fairness to you, uh, the evidence we received is that they attempted to serve this document to the police in Banjul. They refused to accept it. Take a look at it. It's a letter addressed to you asking for a permit. Do you have an application form for these things or just a letter would do? A letter would do. So if this letter was received by your office, it would have been a valid application for a permit, correct? Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, but it was, according to the evidence we have, uh, the deputy president, the vice president of the Students' Union, indicated that when this letter was taken to your offices by the secretary, they refused to accept it. What do you say to that? It, I would not say it's not true, but I am unaware. Were police officers in your office instructed not to receive these types of letters, requests for permits to demonstrate? That kind of uh, uh, instruction would not come from me, certainly not. But, but the environment in the police force at the time, was it such that people would be afraid to receive letters like this? In any case, if they were afraid, it would not be, be because of me. Certainly but, not. But what was the environment like? Well, all eyes were on the police, I guess, under the circumstances. But certainly, those instructions didn't come from my office. How many meetings did you attend at the police? At the, at the Gambia College? Only, uh, I, and only one. Only one. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just, hold, just hold a second, please. Uh, I have another account here uh, of the same meeting that I talked to you about earlier, the 24th of March. And this is what the account says, that... I quote, Friday the 24th March 2000, a strange situation happened because that very morning around 7 a.m. to our surprise, the IGP, Sankung Baji, I think the witness meant the deputy IGP, and Interior Minister Usman Baji at the time came to the college while most of us were asleep and we were woken up from beds, from our beds, 
to a meeting which was chaired by the vice principal of the college, Mr. Bojang. The meeting lasted for less than 30 minutes. The tone of the IGP and the minister were aggressive, harsh, and very intimidating. Ali spoke at length on our stance, which remains, and I assume, that my statement cut the meeting short, as I told them that we were on the right course, and as long as what we were doing was not wrong, we were not afraid of anything, which was triggered by the intimidating statement so they left on that same day. There was a press conference at KMC by Gamso. So this, this witness also indicated that there were threats from the IGP and from the SOS. Well, according to him, the IGP was Sankung Bari. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he may have been referring to you, he may have been referring to Sankung Bari. We don't know who he's referring to. Yeah. But in any case, a representative of the police threatened them on that day. What do you say to that? Well, let me hasten to say, I don't know. A lot of people did not know, know me in person. That I can tell you for a fact. A lot of people did not know me in person because I have had instances where people have said they saw me in places that I never was. So it is quite possible that they may have meant my, my deputy instead of me because what you, what you are quoting for me now that I went to the airport, to the college when the people were sleeping, is not true. I was never there. Did, how many times did you go to the to the college? To the college for Only once. Year. Only once. Only once. All right. Have you ever authorized the deputy IGP to go to the Gambia College for a meeting? Not, not that I can remember. No. So you can't recall the deputy IGP going to taking, taking leave of me to go for for that meeting. Yes. No. Did you attend a meeting at Gambia College comprising of uh, uh, representatives of the NIA as well? Are you refer referring to yet another meeting? Even that first meeting were representatives of the NIA present. Now, I do know that I was there with uh, the, my deputy and uh, uh, landing Baji. The minister was there. But to say that I had people from NIA, they may have come, but not, to, not on my invitation anyway. Not on my but invitation. did you see anybody there who represented the NIA? They didn't identify themselves to me. So the bottom line at the end of the day is that the students were not happy with the way they were treated by state officials. And they thought they were being intimidated not to carry on with their demonstration. What do you say to that? I, I, it, is, it is unfortunate, uh, Council, because uh, in as much as I was the IG and uh, I had state interests, to see that uh, we had peace and security in the country. It was also very clear to me that I was being branded as being sympathetic with the students, undoubtedly. And unfortunately, I don't think the students were aware of that. Branded by who? Oh, yes, by, by the, the government of the day. They thought I was too sympathetic with the students. And I was not sympathetic. I was just doing what I thought was right. All right. I can see in the file a letter from the IGP inviting, uh, inviting the students' union to a meeting at your office. That was the one for which I left to the airport. I'm sure that's the one. Okay. All right. Even on the one that you left for the airport, the students indicated that they were rudely treated while they were there. They were threatened, and you abruptly left and went to the airport. That, that, is, that is not true. I think these are all make-up stories, Council, because I told them that I am sorry I will have to leave to go to the airport, and I am handing them over to my deputy. That's what happened. Uh, I have here uh, the list of demands that were made by the students, 
I will send it to you to take a look at. Uh, these were letters that were addressed to you. I'll see whether you've received them. Have you ever seen those letters addressed to you? No. You've never seen those letters? Never seen You've letter. never received those letters? I've never seen this one. Well, the students allege that they have sent several letters to your office, copied the Department of, uh, of Education and uh, Department of uh, the Ministry of the Interior, in which they demanded that the fire officers who tortured Ibrahim Ahbari be brought to justice, that uh, those involved in the torture be redeployed, and that the culprit in the rape of Pintamane be identified or prosecuted, and the officer in charge of the PRU on duty at that post on that day be held responsible. Did you ever respond to any of those demands? I, I as an individual did not because as I said to you much earlier, I am seeing these letters for the first time. But um, if at all these letters were submitted to your office as the students allege and uh, as the exhibit also suggests, wouldn't you say that there is a fundamental problem in your office wherein communication does not reach the intended or designated officer? In the, in the light of what is happening now, it is very clear that something was not right. But would you say that was some, that something that was not right, would you say is a fundamental problem? Would you agree? Oh, it's yes. a, it's oh, a yes. fundamental problem. Oh, yeah. That's correct. So, hence, the students were disgruntled. They were angry. And they thought they were being ignored. What do you say to that? Uh, the media school of thought may have been right. But like I said, unfortunately, this didn't reach me. So... As at this time, towards the end of March, it was quite obvious that something was brewing. There was gross discontent by the students, and they were making threats that they would demonstrate. Could you tell us how that was handled at the level of the police mm -hmm. after the last meeting you had with them? Well, information that reached us at the time through the CID officers was that this was not just a student's matter, but that politicians were under the whole issue. And which politicians were suspected? They did not mention them. They just said politicians, meaning maybe opposition politicians. So you, at the police, believed that... Not, not, that, not that we believed. That we, these were the allegations that... Uh, opposition politicians were the ones pushing the students and use, using them as front. And uh, as a result of that, did you take any action? Well, we, 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 we got the CID to work and to find out what was going on at my level, because I never used to go to the ground. Anything that I wanted to do or have done, I will tell my deputy, CMC, the Commission of Operations, and they will handle it. So, as a result, did the police plan a response to what they expect would happen? Yeah, yeah that's quite possible, yes. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about possibilities. We're talking about what actually happened. Yes, did they, plan, they, the plan, police, they plan a response. Could you tell us about that? Well, the response was that if it was going to be a political thing, then they should go get down to the bottom of it and find out who was involved. 
And then? But that, 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 they never came up with anybody. No names were brought up. And how about in a response to the students' demonstration? Like I said to you, the demonstration itself, when it was very apparent, the instructions that came from me, which warranted the Commissioner of Operations to issue uh, his orders, was that if the students wanted to come to Banjul to come and see the vice as they demanded, they should be allowed to do so. The question of beating or killing, or, that, never, that never arose. Never in any meeting that I was present in. Never. As a force uh, for which you are responsible, did you hold a meeting to discuss what was, going, what was happening and how to respond to it? Oh, yes. A few meetings were held at the headquarters, myself, my deputy, the police advisor, the uh, commission. Give us names, sir. Oh, yeah. The deputy, Sankung uh, Baji, the police advisor, Tamsir Jase, the commissioner of operations, um, Babu Karso. These ones I can remember very well. There are a few other names I can remember. I, had, I used to have regular meetings with them on this, on this matter. And, and what were your conclusions? My own instructions were that if it is that they want to come and see the vice president on this matter, let them be escorted. That is why, as I said to you much earlier, I was insisting that if they want to hold a demonstration, let them arrive so that I'll be in the picture. Okay. What planning did you have? Was it in relation to if they wanted to visit the vice president, or was it in relation to if they were going to demonstrate? Yeah, well, for me, it's one and the same thing, because if they were going to demonstrate, uh, they said they were, not, they were not going to ask for a permit. I told my deputy and the CMC and the uh, operations commander that they must never, at any, under any circumstance, malhandle the children. I emphasized that. I did. Who did you tell? Oh, my deputy, my operation, they all. That is what necessitated uh, Commissioner So sending out that uh, um, instruction. Um, what instruction? For them to, the operational instructions. Uh, were, were any issued for that particular operation? The Commissioner So should have done that. Have you ever seen those instructions? No, no, no. I didn't have to see them. But how do you know they were issued? Well, if I give instructions, I expect them to be carried out. I would send you a document. Uh, do take a look at it and let us know. I am referring to Exhibit 83 and uh, page 263. Mr. Chair. It is this one. Look at the next page as well. Council, is this the operational orders that we had seen yesterday. Yes. So he doesn't need to come back to us. Right, thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you. You have gone through the document, did you, sir? Yes, I have. Would you say that these operation orders adequately captured the orders that you gave Commissioner Sow? Yeah, to a large extent. Uh, is there anything that you may have ordered which is not captured in the operation orders? I don't think so because, as I say, these were the riot equipment that we were supposed to use. 
nothing like using firearms or life ammunition, nothing like that. Uh, the significant part of the operation orders say as follows. I'm referring specifically to the discretions and initiative section. Uh, that is paragraph 7 of the, of the operation orders. And it says as follows, and I quote, during the execution of our lawful duties, commanders are required to be as discreet as possible and use only that necessary force required for handling any situation. All members of the force are reminded that they should be courteous, open, neutral, tact, and approachable. Duties are to be carried out in accordance with the law and stand to protect life and property in the best possible and discreet manner. We should avoid provoking disturbances and bear the required level of tolerance to avert any situation. Subunit heads are required to depict from this general instruction for their own consumption and take account of the men under their command, including equipment. Would you say this captured? Yeah, this is standard. And this is what you intended? This is standard, yes. In fact, you don't have to tell anybody that. It's standard. Uh, this, these instructions did not talk about use of weapons. Life ammunition. Life ammunition. No. And this is what you intended it's as, just, as that, that, IGP? That, that was the whole idea. Mm -hmm. And you made it clear to Saul that this oh, is yes. what you intended? Oh, yes. That's no, that's no secret. But the thing is, this document was signed in your name. That's for, for IG. Mm -hmm. But you did not see the document? No. Wouldn't it have been necessary for you as IGP to see the under, document? Under the circumstances now, yes, maybe in retrospect, but one, one should have had a look at it. But, but it is not normal for your operations commander to issue out his detailed instructions and then you come back as I say, let me see. It's, it's not normal. But, but, but these things are issued in your name as IGP. Oh, yes. So it should definitely be normal for you to be satisfied as IGP that what is contained in the document, in fact, conveys your orders, your instructions. Council, I dare, I dare say that there are many occasions when letters or things do go out in the name of the IGP signed, and it's signed for, on, him, for he, on his behalf, and you don't see it. It is quite normal. But, but this is not a simple matter. This now, is, now this is simple, a question but, but, of... But then, but then I did not expect that this would have been the outcome of this um, uh, incident. But, but this is, these are operations. Yeah and uh, you issuing operational orders uh, in the name of the police force. Uh, this is an important activity, and it would require, under, under normal circumstances, the, the oversight of the IGP to ensure that the orders that are being conveyed are, in fact, the orders that you have dictated. Yes, that may be so, but what normally happens is that if letters, which are, this is an, is an internal letter, if letters for internal consumption are written and signed for the IGP, the IGP under normal circumstances will not go back to say, let me see. A letter which is going outside the headquarters, that I would agree. I will have to make sure that I have a look at it and see what yeah. is there. Yeah. Yes, this was internal to the police, but it was also going out of headquarters yeah, but to, still to within other the police, units. Still within the police. And you did not think it was necessary for at you the to At the time, see. at the time, no. How about dissemination? Would it be necessary to have this properly disseminated to all the units relevant? That, that, that again would have been the responsibility of the uh, commissioner operations. Uh, what do you say to the suggestion that this was not, in fact, disseminated to the forces below? Well, that may have been a break in communication, but that, again, falls under the ambit of the commissioner. But such, you would agree with me, that such a break in communication would be a significant lapse on the part of the police, wouldn't it? Yeah, but, uh, uh, counsel, what is not coming out is where the break in communication occurred, between who and who. 
Uh, we've just received testimony uh, from the uh, commander of the PIU, uh, who is a critical part of the forces that were deployed to deal with the demonstration. And he told the commission that he did not see this document. And that would have been a very serious break in communication. And uh, as IGP, you would accept, therefore, that if there were breaks in communication in the police with regards to communicating operational orders, the ultimate responsibility would rest with you. As IG, yes, I'm the IG, but I can tell you that this operation was such so that there are certain things which I cannot take responsibility for because I did what was right. Yes, uh, let's take it step by step uh, on this issue of breakdown in communication, especially communicating operational orders. Ultimately, as IGP, you would be responsible, wouldn't you? Not in that sense. I, I take responsibility as the head of the police, being IGP. Yes. But the, the but is, I did everything right. Got the commissioner operations to do what is right. Now, if there is a break, it's between the commissioner and those below him. Uh, uh, I, 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 I cannot be IG, then I, be, I, am, I am operations commander, then I am in, inspector of PIU. No, I cannot. Uh, we Otherwise, I, 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 it's a one-man force. I am not a one-man force. I appreciate that. But what I am saying is this is a fundamental lapse, a fundamental problem within the institution. And as head of the institution, you are ultimately responsible. Wouldn't you agree? I will agree that as the head of the police, yes, I have, I have a responsibility. Well, you are but, appearing but, here as the head of the police. <laughs> yes, I, yes, that's right. That's why I'm here. And that's why I'm willing to tell you the truth. Okay. Yes. So uh, let, let, let us proceed. Let us, let us proceed. So um, just prior to the events, you received information about the impending demonstration. Uh, you directed, uh, you gave your orders as to what should happen, and then operational orders were issued, uh, whether disseminated or not. Uh, tell us what happened after this meeting when the operational orders were issued. Tell us what happened as far as you can recall. Starting Didn't perhaps from the day before the demonstration on the 9th of April onwards. Oh yes, um, I remember we had further information that the children wanted to um, march into Banjo to go and see the vice president. I, I gave instructions that if that was the case, let them be allowed to go and see the vice president. Uh, from where did you get that information? Oh, that these were intelligence reports. And to whom did you communicate those oh, orders? Again, my deputies, CMC, operations, they all. I kept nothing to myself. Okay. Uh, and uh, don't you think that, uh, do you accept that those orders were very important orders? that if they want to go to Banjul and see the vice president, you would facilitate it. Oh, yeah. You would ensure I said that. that. I said that. And if don't any, you if think anybody stands up to the, and deny that, yes, they may. But I said so. Uh, but you would agree that these important orders, in fact, needed to have been included in the operation orders. No, but at that time, this, that information did not arise. But don't you think that when this information was received, it was necessary that it was passed on to the forces that would be on the ground? I did that. I, I passed it on to the deputy, to the CMC, to the officials commander. I did that. On the normal procedures, this should have, in fact, led to the creation of a revised or amended operation orders which are sent and disseminated to the forces on the ground. I, I, am, I am afraid you are talking about normal circumstances, Council. Uh, yes, yes, I would imagine that uh, the
police force was a normal force operating no. under normal yes, circumstances. Yes, but on that day, you, you are talking about the day before the actual demonstration, which was on a Sunday. It was Saturday, Sunday, and this thing happened on Monday. Now, yes. there was no way you, go, you would go and write letters. No, no. It doesn't work like that. Okay. Even if, due to circumstances, you cannot amend the written operation orders, you would imagine that this new information, this new order, would be communicated to the forces on the ground. I would have thought so. Do you know whether, in fact, this new order was communicated to the forces on the ground? I don't know whether it was communicated to the forces on the ground, but what I do know, and that is where, I mean, you have not asked me that question yet. Well, you know? we haven't finished, <laughs> have we? Well, if you want me to go, I'll go ahead. Uh, uh, the question is, do you know whether this, this new fact, this new order that you have given to your subordinates, whether it's been communicated to the forces on the ground? I don't know. Did you take any steps to inquire as to whether this new circumstance, this new order that you have given, whether it's been communicated to those on the ground? I don't know. Would it, in fact, surprise you to know that all those who testified so far from the police did not mention this new fact? Well, I don't know why. Maybe the, as you say, I don't know. That's why I said to you, there is something I would have loved to say, but I'm, I'm waiting for you to allow me to say it. Uh, go ahead. Because on the day of the demonstration itself, because uh, somebody I used to confide in was my permanent secretary, Mrs. Teres Drame, she was. On the day of the demonstration, whilst in my office on that early morning, she called me. I, I said, who's that? Oh, P.S. I said, P.S., good morning to you. How are you? And straight away she said to me, I.G., congratulations. I said, for? He said, I am just driving along Westfield, coming down to P.I.U., going down to GTT, and everything is quiet. Congratulations once again. So I said to her, thank you so much. What were you being congratulated for? Because of the calm. So she thought, she thought uh, yeah. you were responsible for that car. Well, she congratulated me. She thought, then I she believed speak. that you were responsible for that car. That's well, why she congratulated, she congratulated you. me. Yeah? Then and, I did, I, I and, didn't, and you I happily didn't, accepted I those didn't congratulations. Stop, I, I didn't stop at that. But you happily accepted the congratulations. Let, 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 let me finish. I didn't, okay. I didn't stop at that. I called Mr. Jasse, who was the police advisor at the time, and I, I inquired. Um, Tamsir, where are you? And he said to me, I am up in the combos. I said, do, can you go by Westfield coming down to PIU, going down to GTTI, and give me an idea of what is going on? And he too, he too, said to me, Rex, I said, hello, Tam, everything is quiet, everything is good, everything is this, everything is that. I said, okay, Tam, Tam, Tamsir, thank you very much. And I continued my work in the office. At around what time was this? Now the timing is my problem now. Some people may have called me around maybe maybe nine o'clock thereabout. Maybe would, would it surprise you to note that in view of the evidence that we have had so far, that conclusion that was conveyed to you mm -hmm. would have been woefully wrong. That is what he told me. In fact, by 9 o'clock, GTTI area was so chaotic, it was even difficult to find a way to go to Bangui. That is what he told me. It was later on after that conversation. In fact, before Tamsir came back to Banjul, my deputy, Sankung, this is why I'm saying there are people who undoubtedly are not seeing the truth. Because once I got that information from Tamsir, my deputy, who was still in the office with me, came to my office and said to me, IG, the information I'm getting is that everything is calm at uh, uh, GTI and that area. I, I, I want to go out and see what is happening. I said, go ahead. If it had happened at that time, my deputy wouldn't come and tell me that I want to go out because everything is calm. I find it distasteful that uh, people have come here and disrespect to this commission and lie. Uh, 
Well, uh, the commission would have to make its own assessments on, on that, but uh, you, you are definitely entitled to your own uh, assessment of the evidence. Uh, but the day before, you had given instructions that if the students want to march to Banjul to see the IGP, to see the vice the president, vice. Mm -hmm. you will facilitate it. Yes. And here you are, Monday morning, you are being told that everything was calm. Mm -hmm. Did you ask whether the students want to march to Banjul to see the vice president? I did not see them, see them in person yet. That's why I'm, I'm saying, let me land, and then you can see where I'm coming from. It was after Proceed. my deputy had left to go up the combos that I got a call from Usain Udabo, Honorable Usain Udabo, Rex, through my secretary. Rex, I said, hello, who's that? Usain Udabo. I said, yes, please. What can I do for you? Rex, I know you are not aware, but the security forces are opening fire on the students. So I said to him, Usain Udabo, uh, please don't joke with this kind of thing. He said, no, I'm not joking. I'm telling you, this is what is happening. I said, thanks for the information. Less than 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, I had my door. The knocking the door and the opening of my door was this almost simultaneous. And I saw Tamsil holding his boat necktie in the left hand, and he shut widely open. I said, ah, Tamsil, what is it? Rex, they have messed up all our arrangements. I said, what do you mean? He said, they messed up our arrangements there. There is fatality. But up to this, before this commission was set up, Nobody will tell me that it was this or that who gave instruction or who did this. Nobody. Okay, it's let's distasteful. Take, let's take things step by step. All right. You had given an order the day before, which seemingly would modify the operation orders that were issued. Correct. Yeah. And the new order was. These students, if they want to go and see the vice president, we should allow them to do so, and we will provide them with escorts to do so, correct? Yeah. This new fact ought to have been communicated to the forces on the ground, correct? Mm -hmm. and, and the forces on the ground would have been required to help coordinate with the students to arrange for them to go to the vice president, correct? Yeah. Do you know whether this was done? Where, where it went wrong, I, up to now, I don't know yet. So the question I have for you is, do you know whether this new order was communicated to those forces on the ground which were required to implement it? I don't know. Uh, let's take it a few steps backwards. To whom did you communicate this new order? The deputy, my deputy, Sankum. Did you communicate it to the so, yes. to so head of operations? Mm -hmm. uh, would it surprise you to note that Mr. So never mentioned anything like that, even though his testimony is not yet concluded, mm -hmm. but he's gone beyond the stage of the happenings of the day before. He's gone beyond the stage of talking about the operation orders. Would it surprise you to note that he never mentioned this new fact you're talking about? Um, I, I cannot speak for him, but... Uh, I would the question is, would I, it surprise you? Mm -hmm. Would it also surprise you to note that uh, Mr. Sise, also Momodu Sise, who was the head of the PIU, who was entrusted with the responsibility of, of dealing with the students or maintaining law and order uh, at GTTI, did not mention this fact. Well, it's a fact that was said. In fact, in fact, his description of events suggests that he was completely ignorant of this new order you are talking about. Well, he's free to say so. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I bring it to your attention, Mr. Former IGP, that Mr. Sise, in fact, claims he never saw 
the written operational orders. What do you say to that? If you say so. His description of the events of that morning is that he, he came there, pursued one to the orders, he asked the students to disperse, they refused to disperse, his group attacked the students, That's beating true. them. That is what should not have happened, because if that didn't happen, maybe there would not have been any incident. There was no need for them to go to GDTI. No. And according to Tamsir, when he said to me that they messed it up, those who were on the ground who messed it up had no business to be there. They had no business to be there. Uh, I don't know them because I was not there, and they refused to tell me who they were. I have inquired until I was cautioned to drop this matter. Uh, we, we will come to that <laughs> gradually. We will come to that gradually. Uh, but at this stage, you were called, Tamsir came to your office. Initially, you were congratulated. And you accepted the congratulations because everything was good and dandy, correct? Uh, but, counsel, if somebody calls you and says congratulations, what do, you, what do you tell them? Don't congratulate me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, say, I said thank you, and that's it. <laughs> no, the, but the question is, is that is how you respond. Uh, if you say, if you, if you, I am talking about how you received it. Uh, where you were happy. Weren't you? Well, happy is relative. <laughs> but, but, but you can't tell us how you felt at the time. <laughs> the thing is, when I was told that they were shooting, I was sudden and angry. That's the truth. At who? At whoever, whoever gave instructions for shootings to take place. Did you, did you withdraw your men? Withdraw men from, from where? Did you give instructions? You suggest your men overstepped your instructions correct somebody instructed them to do that i don't know who it is okay we would come to that i don't know who it is we would come to that but your stance is that your men overstepped the authority you gave them yeah correct correct did you take any steps to remedy that situation what steps you can take did you withdraw your men? Did you give an order to withdraw all your men? I, I only knew all this. These are afterthoughts when things have happened. Uh, when, what time did Tamsir Jase arrive at your office? I told you that once he had called me some 15, 20 minutes after he came to my office from the Combos. That was after 9 a.m.? Must have been, yes, certainly. At that stage, you knew that everything was going out of what was planned? No, no. Not, Everything was not, going wrong? Not before Tamsir came to me. No, what I mean is at the stage that Tamsir came to your office to say that they have messed up the plan, they have messed up our operation, mm -hmm. this was after 9 a.m., correct? It was soon after I got the call from Usain Rudabo that Tamsir came to my office and confirmed. Okay, let's situate it to time. This the, time, was the, the time now is a bit of a problem for me because I cannot actually remember the time frame. But what I am telling was you... Was it is, in the morning? Oh, yes, well, it's in the morning, not in the afternoon. 9 a.m. or 10 a.m.? Around that time. I don't want to give you the okay. wrong time. Okay, let's say 10 a.m. All right? At this stage, did you give any order to withdraw your forces? No, certainly not. Why didn't you? I didn't want to get in. Take any steps to withdraw them? No. Why didn't you? Because I did not want to be associated with whatever wrong they had done. Because I knew very well that if I had got involved, if I had gone there, 
the blame would have very much, you know, come on me. But, 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 as, but as we speak. Uh -huh. uh, but let me, let me just finish. Uh, there is one thing, right, that is wrong the police had done without your knowledge, outside the authority you have given them. That is one thing. Okay? Wrong that they continue to do after you were aware that they were doing wrong. You, you see, these are two different positions. The first is they did it without your knowledge. The second one is they were continuing to do it after you became aware that they were doing wrong. Wouldn't this give rise to command responsibility for the conduct that they were going to do after you became aware the, of the fact that they were doing something wrong? Shall I speak? Yes, please. Go ahead. I, I, ref I refuse to say yes or no because if I had gone there at the time, I, could I you kindly answer to the question? I'm not talking about you going there. In fact, when you gave your orders, you did not go there. Huh? You did not go there. What I am alluding to is, perhaps you should listen to me carefully. You gave the police orders and you came to realize that they were not implementing your orders, they were doing something wrong, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the time you realized they were doing something wrong, didn't you think that you were legally obliged to take action to stop them from continuing to do what you believe was legal was wrong? No, I don't think I was wrong. Did you submit that to legal advice from your team? At that point in time, no. But do you realize that under the law of command responsibility, you have, in fact, abrogated your responsibility? You, you ought to have taken steps to prevent the police from continuing the wrong they were doing. What, what prevailed at the time, uh, Council? and the circumstances under which it happened, I would not have got involved at all. If it were a day like today in this new dispensation, you know what I would have done, Council? I would have resigned that same day, that very day. But of course, I wouldn't give them the pleasure. That would have been very heroic by me to say, yes, I resign, but I would have paid the price. I knew it. Uh, but resignation would, in fact, be something to do later. No, I would have done it that same day. Uh, yes, but... My that point here, my point here. I, is see where you, I see where you're coming from, Council. I, I asked, I was the head of police, fine. They had flouted my instructions, fine. They had done something wrong, fine. But I could not have got myself involved because this was instructions that came from somewhere and somebody is refusing to tell me who gave those instructions. We would come to that. We haven't <laughs> quite reached at that. Well, the point I'm trying to make is the law of command responsibility is that if you know that your troops or your forces were going to commit offenses and you do not stop them, you are responsible for yeah, the but, offenses but, they are committing. I did not know that they were going to command, com commit offenses. But I you were know. told already. After they had done it. Yes, but the thing is, it did not stop there. They continued their actions. They did not stop at 10 a.m., their actions continued well into the afternoon. Yeah, but Council, you will, you will also recall that, that evidence has uh, proven and shown that it was not only the police officers who were involved. Ah, let's, let's, let's be honest. I, I agree. So but when, I, I am... when I keep saying that people were involved, I know exactly what I'm saying. Yes, I agree. And, and, I, and I know how vulnerable I had become. Okay, yes, Mr. Mr. King. <laughs> with all due respect, I agree with what you are saying. But we are not attributing responsibility to you for actions committed or carried out by forces that were not under your control. We are strictly talking about the police. Yeah, Did you take any steps at 10 a.m. to stop the police from continuing with their unlawful act? No, I did not. 
And would you say, would you accept uh, that you are in fact legally and morally obliged to do something to stop your police officers from continuing with their illegal conduct? Under normal circumstances, I would have. So you suggesting, therefore, that the circumstances were such that your conduct, according to law, changed? That may be so, but I can tell you that under the circumstances on which this thing happened, I could not have stopped them. Yeah. I, would have, I, I would have achieved nothing. But at least it would have been on record that you have done what you were required to do. That may be true. And in that case, it would have been easy for you sitting here to say, I did all I could. Don't you think? Yes, I agree with you entirely. And I told my deputy when they came back eventually. My difficulty here is that up to this blessed day, as we speak, I cannot tell you that this man or that man or this woman gave instructions. And I find it very sad and frustrating. <laughs> Again, I would tell you the fifth time we would come to that. Please do. Uh, but what I am trying to drive at here uh, is that up, up until this period, you just decided to say, let me wash my hands off this. I don't want to have anything to do with this. And you give everything a blind eye. Stayed in your office as if you're not concerned. Is that exactly what happened? I, I was concerned, very much concerned, but I didn't want to get involved whilst they were there on the ground, no. But this was your operation? It was part of my operation, yes. It was your operation which has gone bad? It went bad, yes. And you disowned it? It, it was a, an operation that went bad through no fault of mine. Yes, but uh, that may very well be the case. But then up, up to that point, you disowned it, and you didn't want to have anything to do with it? Because I knew exactly what would have happened. Uh, no, okay, you will tell us what would have happened, but before that, tell us the fact. You disowned the operation at that point. I would not call it disowned, but I did not want to get involved because they would have put it all on me. But isn't it the same? Disowning it it's, and it's, washing your hands off it and staying away from it it's, it's and bit, keeping it's, quiet it's and closing your eyes all boil down to the same fact that you did not do anything else. There's a bit of a difference. Anyway. Uh, thank you very much. But as you sat in your office, what did you do next? You received information that this thing has gone bad. There are casualties. You did not withdraw your forces what else did you do? No, once, once the GTTI area had been cleared, I, I started to get information that they are doing uh, other things in other places. Some had, to not, had nothing to do with the police. I understand other security services okay. were involved. Let's, so, let's, let's, for the moment, focus on the police. What were they doing? And this was not just a police operation, uh, Council. I agree. Uh, let's, let's focus because you cannot be asked questions about the conduct of other forces that were present. So let's focus on your forces, mm -hmm. the police. What else were they doing after they cleared Westfield? Well, they went back to their, to their, to their barracks. In the, in the repair, you went to Kanifing, where they are housed. And uh, we inquired, said the thing had extended to the provinces. But police operations in the provinces were virtually very minimal, if any at all. That much, that much I know. Uh, normally, after a police operation... Oh, there should be a debriefing. Was <laughs> there a debriefing? Yeah, that's what I, there, there was supposed to be a debriefing. And I've, I tried to have it several times. You get nothing out of it. That is why during my testimony earlier on, I said to you, if he did not succeed in doing anything, he succeeded in putting fear in the people. Nobody, the council, I'm telling you, nobody who in those days will come and tell you that this man or that man did this or said that. Nobody. It's now everybody's brave. Did you call for a debriefing? 
Of course. Tell us who you called. Oh, my, as I told you, my management team. That's, it's not once, it's not twice. Did they come for a debriefing? They would come. And so then, if I did, call they, them, they, did they debrief? Well, and what they will debrief is uh, we went there, what's the day? Who is they? That's my million dollar question. Who is they? I ask you the question. What? So you tell us what, have, what have, you gathered from I don't have the, the forces the, that you deployed. I don't, have the, I don't have the answer, unfortunately. If that is what is going okay. to kill me, I will die because I don't have the answer. You, you will not die. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we want to know what know. you ask them and the answers they provided you. I kept saying, not once, not twice, not five times, not ten times, how did the orders change? Who authorized the use of life ammunition? Who this, who that? They, they who is they? Who is they? Who Somebody did, must have said so. She say, she say who is the officer in charge of the PIU and who is supposed to be in charge of the ammunition at the PIU? How did the ammunition come out? You are the IGP. <laughs> you tell me. I don't have the answer. And it's unfortunate and it's very sad. Uh, and I ask these questions again. Your debriefing. Tell us what you did at the debriefing and what, what were the questions you asked and what were the answers you received in, in, and in, from in, whom? In, in debriefing, you ask questions, direct questions, and you talk as a family. Who did this? Who did that? You don't have an answer, counsel. You don't have an answer. Tell us the questions that you asked. Apart from who did this, who did that, put it in concrete terms. Who did what? What you ask them, brother? Who authorized the use of life ammunition? Did you get confirmation from your forces that they used life ammunition? Oh, that was, I mean, I didn't, I didn't need to have confirmation from my forces. It was all over the country that students, still students had been killed. Now, I want you to know, who killed them? I want you to know. In fact, talking like even my own relative died in that thing. That may I mean, very well be the case. Yes. This is something that has affected all of us. Yes, so, so I am, I am, I, that's why I, said I was angry and sad. All of us were. But the question is, what questions did you ask them? And what answers were you given? Any, any question would you think a reasonable person would have asked? I did. And I had, I had Give no us answer. examples of what you asked. For example, I said to them, look, you had been given clear-cut instructions as to what to do. Now, the question of using live ammunition did not arise. Who authorized the use of live ammunition? But, but before, before asking them the question, who authorized the use of live ammunition, wouldn't it have been necessary to, in fact, conclude that they used live ammunition? No, I, don't, I, I cannot suggest that. Let them tell me. Do you know whether, in <laughs> fact, your forces use life ammunition? That's what I'm saying, uh, counsel. The question they, is, they, they do were, you know I whether know. they use life ammunition? If I say I know, I'll be lying. I am assuming from the information I got that life ammunition was used. Otherwise, otherwise, there would have been no casualty. Yes. But now, for all of them to have been on the ground, that place there, and nobody can tell me that I saw this, um, this man was the one who gave instructions for us to use ammunition. This man was the man who shot. Nobody can tell me that. I agree. I agree. Those are questions we, we are also concerned about. And I agree these I, are I, questions. I, I, wish, I wish I knew. But, but the question I am asking is, did you first establish whether your forces, in fact, used life ammunition? I asked the question. I asked the question. Was life ammunition used? It's, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. I said, of course, otherwise so, there would have so, been no... So you are suggesting to us that your forces confirmed that they used life ammunition? They did not say they used They said life ammunition was used... Okay. That's Did you form. ask them whether they, in fact, used live ammunition? The people I am asking are my, my officers, my deputy, my, com, com, my com, commissioner operations, my CMC. They are not the ones who used ammunition. They are not the ones who fired. They are supposed to tell me what they know 
in terms of information that they got. If I don't have it from them, who will tell me? I even had cause to be calling people from the NIA. Okay. Did you call the commander of the units on the ground to find out whether his troops used life ammunition? I asked him that question. Who did you ask? CC, I asked him that question. I asked CC, CC, how did this shooting come about? Say, boss, boss. I said, no, tell me. Nobody is talking. Okay. Nobody. So so, but there you know. And, and to tell you the truth, because they were not talking, I was not happy, but I could see where they are coming from. Uh, we would come to all that. <laughs> we would come to all that. For now, you know that your forces, your units were not giving you the answers. They were not telling you whether they used life ammunition. They were not telling you who used life ammunition, correct? Uh, somebody was not telling me the truth. But there was a way of determining whether, in fact, your units used live ammunition or not, apart from asking them. The, the simplest way was to uh, check with them in terms of what did they have in stock prior to the incident, what do they have left. That all I did. So very clearly, from what I gathered, some ammunition were missing. Shells were picked up. But who, did who, you who used them? Who expelled them? But did you... I should not be guessing, counsel. Exactly. Precisely the point. You shouldn't be guessing. Did you do the audit of no, their didn't. ammunition? No, I, I did. Personally, did not. Somebody has had... had did had, you had. instruct anybody to do that audit? <laughs> Unfortunately, I did not. But I did not have to do that. But, but you would agree that such an exercise was necessary in order for you to be able to establish whether your forces, in fact expelled life ammunition or not? Uh, what, what you are saying, Council, this is, these are things that we did. My operations commander, when I asked him who did this, who did that, was a life bullet used, he would have been the one to tell me that, oh yes, because I checked the ammunition, I checked this. I, I am not supposed to be IG who will go to the street like, okay. like I'm seeing IG controlling traffic. I agree. You think I will go and control traffic? I agree. You don't have to. Except if you are action man, you can sit oh, yeah, by I don't the action man project. I'm going to do that. <laughs> but, but, but I agree. I agree. But the question I am asking is, you have asked questions about whether they have used live bullets or not, and you did not get an answer. All right? And there was there a procedural and scientific way of assessing whether they, in fact, have used live ammunition. But you did not use it. It would have been to know because I inquired. This question of finding out is what led to my exit. But did you order an audit? I don't know whether I'm going to call it an audit, audit but I tried to inquire. And I knew that in the, in the process of inquiring, I would not last long. This thing happened, this thing happened in April. But you, May, yeah. June, I was away. I knew it. I, I accept that. I accept that. But what I am trying to establish is that under the procedures of the Gambia Police Force, after an operation, you have to do uh, the, 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 the quartering the job yes. of assessing what was used and what was not used and what was left. Isn't that a procedure? That is, a, that is normal procedure. Did you do that normal procedure? No. I personally did not. Did you order? Did you order I, I anybody? Did, I, I didn't have to order, counsel. That's the point I'm trying to make. I didn't have to order for that to be done. Otherwise, but, otherwise there's no point having all these big, big officers with all these things on their shoulders. Yeah, but you, here you are, you needed answers. You could not get answers because this procedure was never it, applied. It, Council, if it was not under the circumstances under which we were we working, I would have had all these answers you are asking for now. It's the circumstances under which we were working, that is why I am in this situation. So, so what I want to establish is, <coughs> you failed to do something that you were required or expected to do. Correct? You can use that language if you like. No, you, you, you would have the opportunity to tell us why you failed. 
But before that, let's establish that you failed to do something that was supposed to have been done. Do you agree that it was to be expected that an audit would be done of the ammunition that was used? It should have been done. And you did not do it? I did not do that. You did not order anybody to do it? No, I did not. And that is a failure, isn't it? If you call it a failure, okay. Uh, no, not that I call it a failure. And because you are insisting on that, Council. No, no <laughs> it's because the reality is that this is a failure. I, I am insisting that it's the circumstances under which we were working that caused this situation to happen. Uh, you would it's, not, it's not for lack of knowledge of what to do. You would explain that later. Because what I am trying to do is trying to go through the elements of the law of command responsibility. And then you would give your own explanation as to why you did not. But first of all, I have to go through all the elements and bring out the evidence. Uh, you know, in fact, if you, your forces have gone beyond their authority, and committed offenses such as killing people, you have a responsibility to have them investigated and punished. Do you know that? That is true. Did you take any effort to determine which of your forces may have committed offenses? We are going back to the same thing, Council. Nobody will tell me. The question is, did you? I made efforts to find out, and I had no result. Uh, do you know that your forces, in fact, arrested and tortured students? I was told so. Did you investigate who participated in that? Well, names have been named. In fact, the few times I have had cause to listen to the proceedings of the commission, I have had people accepting that they did this and the other. So it's now, uh, fortunately, and that maybe thanks to the TRRC, that one is even knowing what is happening. But prior to the TRRC, nobody will tell you anything. Nobody. Across the board. Nobody. Now everybody is brave. Thanks, thank God for that. Now we are hearing stories. Thank God for that. I was a very lonely man. You know it. I told you. <laughs> well, I am not the commission. You have to tell the commission. Yeah. You see? I am, I, am not, I, am, I am not smiling over this. Uh, certainly not, because, because what the questions you are asking me, they hurt, because I know what I went through. They hurt. Well, be rest assured, my objective is not to hurt you. My objective is to bring out the truth you know, I'm, about I'm not what saying, I'm not saying you hurt me. I'm not saying you hurt me. I say the questions that I'm answering, they hurt me, because I know what I went through. Was I, was I, was I having a jolly time? Uh, you would accept, uh, Mr. Witness, that there were lots of failures on the part of the police, correct? There were failures only because of the circumstances we found ourselves in. Otherwise, all what you are saying, rightly, rightly so, they shouldn't have happened. No. This incident would have been confined to what it was supposed to be only. But it was blown out by people who had no business in this. Could you explain that? What do you mean? The names that I was told of people who were there had no business to be there. This was purely a police operation. You tell us, we're listening, what names do you have when about those who were there and were not supposed to be there? When Tamsir came to my office and said to me, they, they blew it up, they messed it up, Rex, everything was going on nicely for these guys. I said, who are these guys? Of course, he would not tell me who are these guys. So I went the other way. I said, by the way, who and who was there? He said, oh, the minister was there. Uh, the chief of, uh, chief of staff was there. N some names I've even forgotten now. Uh, now, I'm saying, so I said to him, but Tamsir, what were they doing there? Give us these names that you have mentioned. Who are these people? Oh, Usman, Usman Baji is the same Usman Baji. He is the, I suppose you want to have the record straight. He was the Minister of the Interior. So you are suggesting that he was not supposed to be there? For what? So you are saying 
What? He interfered with police operations. To do what? No, no, no. I'm saying. And they, and are they you called, suggesting? They, and they, they called some other names. Are you suggesting that he interfered with police operations? I am not suggesting that he interfered. I'm saying they were not supposed to be there. And by being there, you are implying that they interfered with police operations. I didn't. I, 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 didn't, I was not there. I was not on the ground. That's why when I went to the first commission, when I was asked, I said, if anybody wants to know what happened there, let them ask those who were on the ground. And they knew who, who, the people who were on the ground. And who are those people? Well, okay, my officers were there. The DIG was there. The commissioner of Give us was, names. Give us DIG names. DIG is something badgy. The operations was uh, landing badgy. The, uh, what's his name? So was uh, uh, operations. The chief of staff was there, Babukar Jata. The minister was there, Usman uh, Baji. The whole lot were there. That is why when Tamsir told me that they messed it up, I said, who? He said, they. I went and I said, well, who? Well, who and who was on the ground? When he told me, I said, I wasn't going there. It's not that I was running away from So the your suggestion, therefore, is that this operation was messed up by... I did not say that. Well... You told us. I said they were there. I didn't. Just, I did. just hold a second. <laughs> you would gradually. I would never misrepresent your words. <laughs> you told us Tamsir came and <laughs> told you they messed up the operation. Correct? Yes. And in order to know who is they, you went like this. That is what you said. Correct? Yes. yes. And when you went like this, you found out that these people were there. Correct? Yes. And these people are Usman Baji, correct? Yeah, that's what he said. Uh, SOS for Interior, correct? Yeah, go ahead. CDS Babukar Jata, correct? And Babukar So, your head of operations, correct? And Sankung Baji, yes, I mentioned him, your deputy IGP, correct? Mm -hmm. So they would collectively refer to us these individuals, so correct? They, they, so they should be able to tell us. So, who, so, who, so who, if who, there what? is anybody who messed it up, you are referring to this group? They should be able to tell us. That's what I'm saying. Are you suggesting that they should be able to tell us who messed it up, or are you suggesting that it is they who messed it up? They should be able to tell us, and that I will leave to the Commission. Okay. Uh, to conclude, uh, Mr. King, you accept that there were failures on the part of the police in terms of communications? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. You also accept failure in not doing anything to stop what was going on after you realized that your orders were not being implemented in the way you wanted them to be implemented? Yeah. Uh, you did so because you did not want to sully yourself or, 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 or you do not want to have a hand in what was going on at the time. Yeah. Uh, and that you did not make an audit in order to determine whether, in fact, your troops used uh, uh, live ammunition. Yeah. You also did not punish members of your forces for going contrary to your orders or for committing violence? No, that I could not have done because <laughs> uh, there was no instruction for them to be punished. But you don't need instructions to punish, to punish your them. men if yeah. they went contrary to orders. Yeah, but that would have been a different dimension. They go to, they go to a commission of, inqui of inquiry, the commission of inquiry comes up with a recommendation, they are indemnified, and then I go and punish somebody. Uh, no, even before that, <laughs> you could have had an internal inquiry. Did you institute any? Uh, Council, I beg to say that uh, your suggestion is far-fetched. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> you, are, you are talking about normal circumstances, Council. Yes. All, what? What you, all what you are doing now is because we are in this dispensation. What, is, uh, what was abnormal at the time? Uh, we all know. So I want to give you the opportunity to give your own evidence. I cannot testify. Uh, so tell us what was abnormal. The whole system was abnormal. Who, who is in the Gambia who will say it was normal? 
Why was it abnormal? Explain yourself, Explain it, Mr. It, it King, was so that we it, understand it, uh, the circumstances. We all know what happened, Council. We all knew what happened. It, 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 was, it was dictatorial. It was this, it was that. We all knew but, what happened. But, Mr. King, we cannot write in the record. We all know what happened and expect that, you know, uh, all that information would be there. Tell us from but your what, own what, account what, I can say to you, what you were facing at what, the time. What I can say to you, Council, is that in as much as it was difficult some of us were brave enough to stay around. Some of us were brave enough to stay around and face it. Uh, uh, what I want you to do, Mr. King, is to explain the circumstances, what the situation was, such that your testimony would be understood in light of the circumstances that you faced at the time. Uh, Council, if anybody in the Gambia doesn't know what used to prevail, I'm not going to tell them that. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Yeah. King, that does not help you. Uh, yes, for me. Because, because what is expected is for you to explain the circumstances you were in at the time. It is only you who can explain it. I cannot go and speak into the record that this is what Mr. King faced. I, I am not complaining. Uh, no, I was, uh, able, Mr. I was King, able. I was able, with the, by the grace of God, to enjoy it. Yes, uh, but Mr. But King, I'm not complaining. Mr. King, I would insist that you answer this question. We want you to explain the circumstances you faced at this time, which made you to take the decisions that you took. Explain these things. It is important. Let us go, Prorata. If it was normal circumstances, would I have been relieved of my duties in June? No, this is a, you say circumstances. It's just one. What, what did I do? Uh, the thing is, Mr. Uh, I did not do anything wrong, but I knew my position. In, my position was such that, oh, this one, he's a sympathizer of UDP. He's a sympathizer of NRP. He's a sympathizer of the students. I, I, I used to hear comments. That is how you were perceived? Of course. Okay. And when I, when I was relieved of my duties, the very day, I'm sorry to hit the table, the very day I arrived home, less than five minutes, I got a call. Hello, Rex, I said, hello. I'm sorry, I hope you have not been relieved of duty because of me. You know who called me? No. Who said no Dabo? Oh, yeah, but what did I tell him? I said, but how do you know this? He said, well, I have just been told, and I feel sorry that you have been victimized because of us. I said, because of you, how? He said, no, because you are my friend. Of course you are my friend. I'm not denying that. Me, if because anybody, me, I was IGP for the Gambia, not for one particular somebody. Uh, but, Mr. King, that is very well, that is very well the case, and we appreciate that. So that's just one, and I don't want to start citing, citing examples. Uh, uh, me, I am, I am saying to you, Council, I do admit that there have been lapses in the police setup. But I also know that if it were normal circumstances, the way this incident took place and how it happened, it would never have been like that. What was abnormal? This is something you are refusing to say, and I insist that you say. Tell us what was abnormal so that we can have it on the record. We cannot just assume that Mr. King said situations were as abnormal, and we assume what made it abnormal. We cannot do that. This is, this, this, we go by evidence, and the evidence must come from the witnesses. We cannot assume it and put it on the record. You have to explain to us what was abnormal under the circumstances. Why was it that you could not do some of the things you were supposed to do? Why was it? The circumstances that we are in in Gambia here. What were the circumstances? Circumstances of fear, circumstances of... Now with the TRRC, as I told you, Council, we are hearing things. I used to hear about killings, about this, about that. I am telling you, cross my heart. Until this commission was established, I never believed that Gambians were the ones doing these killings until I heard it from this TRRC. You know what they used to tell us as the IG? That people used to come from Kasamas in black, black at night. As, and I used to say ah, it's possible because I never thought that Gambians, Gambian to Gambian, particularly. you telling us, Mr. King, that, that you were afraid, to, afraid do, of what? to do more than what you have done. Afraid to do what? You were afraid to investigate 
what I happened? was not afraid to investigate because otherwise I would not have stood in front of Kichi and told him what I told him. What I am saying is that if I had done certain things, that would have been very heroic on my side. Very heroic. But I, I would have achieved nothing. And maybe by now, you, 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 I would have been delayed. If you don't understand that, Council, well, I am so sorry that I cannot go any further. Uh, Mr. King, we rest assured that I understand. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, we are trying to build a record here. Yes, build a, build a record and understand. And, and, and it is in your interest. No, but what, what I don't, me, me, I don't mind. Let somebody say that, I mean, uh, I ask IG, I decided. I don't mind. But I know I have a conscience, a clear one. I appreciate that you have a conscience. And a very clear one for that matter. Yes. But what I want us to understand is the environment in which you operated at the time. It, you, it, it behoves you to explain what this environment was. I will not lie to you. What was the environment like? I will not lie to you. you know, if, if nobody, if people don't understand the environment that we were in, I leave it at that. So you would refuse to help the commission I've, by I've done, explaining... I've, I've done my best. I've done my best, and I was expecting that you would understand. Because you know what happened here. Mr. Mr. King, you're asking me to read between the lines. No. But you were, were you not here? Mr. Mr. Rex, Mr. King, the record that we are trying to build was not here. Okay. It is not for me to give evidence. I, have not, I do not have to take from my knowledge of what has happened in the past and put that in the record. I am polluting the record. It is for you who is the witness to testify about your circumstance at the time so that we understand it. And but, please, but please. I, I thought I had told you enough. No, please, I beg you, Mr. King. This is a national responsibility. Answer the questions. Why did you do the things that you did? Were you afraid? Was that the circumstance? Was that the reason? The question of being afraid does not arise. It's not okay. being, okay. I don't like the choice of word. It's not a matter of being okay. afraid. Correct. Use the right word. It's not a question of being afraid. Use the right word. Because Tell us what was the if, circumstance. If, if you are afraid, maybe you will say that they are going to this. That. No, we've had what has happened. Me, I'd rather die than be subjected to certain things. I'd, I'd rather die. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I don't know how to go about this any further. Uh, I thought, really, that... Uh, I'll be discharging my responsibilities if I give Mr. King the opportunity to explain the circumstances in which he made the decisions he made. The circumstances... But, but tell me something, uh, Council. Let, let me see whether I can, I can get, get uh, over this. Look. No, what, do you want, what do you want to know from? Yes, sir. Okay. What I want give to... Give me a second for yes. both of you. I think, I hope, witness, you don't get the impression, impression that this exchange is confrontational. It's not. If you look at um, uh, the primary, the principal objective of this commission, uh, you need to understand what it is. To create an impartial record, historical record of violations and abuses of human rights uh, from July 1994 to January 2017. To help us do that, witnesses come here to give us details of the truth of exactly what has really happened. Yes, you can have an umbrella of certain uh, events, certain interpretations, but uh, our duty here is really to try to get those details to help us create this historical record. I think you did very well in creating at least two big umbrellas that you have a lot of things happen under fear in the country, which is very genuine, as you pointed it out. And the second one, dictatorship. 
what council was trying to get to is to get the details of some of those things for our record. It would help us understand what witnesses are trying to um, get to us. But if you just give the general uh, uh, description of fear and dictatorship and say, well, look, this is it. So if you, as I said, the idea is to come and help us establish this historical record, not confrontation at all. There might be some exchange in there, but please don't get the impression that we bring witnesses here and then confront them and uh, get them perhaps some upset or so. No, it is somewhat to get into some of those details. I believe we can continue. Uh, and uh, so I see, see what it is that's there. Thank but if you, you can Mr. give us details of that. Fear and dictatorship, you're absolutely right. To operate under that one? <laughs> Incredible. Those things are not around anymore. That's why you have these facts coming out. People are talking about these things. We find a way of um, uh, establishing the record. Council, you wanted the matter. Uh, Can uh, we continue? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I mean, I, I am sure Mr. King would understand that uh, uh, all I am trying to do is, is to get the facts from you. What I would uh, rather, if I may, uh -huh. is ask me the direct question of any particular instance of whatever it is, and I will answer you. Okay, okay. I, I, I'll, take, I'll do that way. I'll do that way. Uh, you told the commission that you asked questions about who did what, and you got no answers, correct? Yeah. Did you believe that the people you asked would have had the answers that you asked for? I believe they, they knew the answers. I believe they knew. And you believe, therefore, they were violating orders by refusing to share those answers with you? Maybe the same word comes into play again. Maybe they were afraid to tell me the truth. But you knew they were violating your orders by refusing to tell you the information that they had? Yeah. Because, like I said to you, I had vowed that I was going to go to the bottom of this. No, and sir. I made it known. I told you that I was even interviewed over Focus on Africa, which is a worldwide thing. And over the radio, I, the man said to me, uh, may I remind you that you are being recorded? I said, yes, record me if you like. And I told him that I was going to go to the bottom of this. And in your quest to go to the bottom of this, you ask information from your staff and they refused to provide the correct information? They did, they did. Yes, they did not. And that would be insubordination in the police, wouldn't it? Yeah, under normal circumstances. Did you punish them for insubordination? No. Why didn't you? I had no legs to stand on. What do you mean by that? Because what, what would I charge them for? Insubordination. No, they, they did not insubordinate me. No. They refused no, they, to answer, they, they, they refused they your to, orders. They failed to give me information, but that, that's not insubordination. Uh, it would amount to that. Anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, in the police force, uh, refusal to follow orders, uh, what would that mean? Disobedience to orders. Exactly. But, Within it's, not, that, but it's, not it's not insubordination. Uh, it is also insubordination. Yeah, but mind. okay, you, you have identified an offense that would have been committed that would be disobedience to orders. Right? Correct? Yeah. Did you charge them with any? No, no. Why didn't you? It didn't, it, it didn't even occur to me to charge them. Why? It didn't occur to me. That's the truth. Uh, you, you believed at the time that you could not do anything to these people. Correct? Yeah, because at, the at that time, if you want to, as I told you much earlier, when, he, when I was asked to dismiss 14 for doing nothing wrong, and I refused, okay, I, I, I went, I, I got away with it. But if I had gone on my, way, on my own now and dismissed somebody because I say he was disobedient to my orders, I would have ridiculed myself in the sense that well, what could have happened would be that maybe I would say I dismiss him. The next minute, he is reinstated and I am dismissed. So what, what did I achieve? And that is the reason why you did not do anything, correct? So there was, I would have achieved nothing. 
that was the reason why you did not yes. do anything. Yes. So you were scared that uh, you would be... Uh, I'm not, not scared of losing my job. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Let me finish. Okay, yeah. uh, you were scared that uh, your f decision as IGP would not be honored. Would That's what not I'm saying. That's why I said I would achieve nothing. You would achieve nothing. All right. So the next issue with regards to uh, the investigations about who among your officers fired shots. Did you go any further than asking questions? No, I only asked questions. And why did you stop at that? I asked and asked and asked and asked, and no, no, no answers, no names. No, in fact, in fact, you realized that you could not do anything to your people anyway, even though they would not comply with your instructions. Mm -hmm. So the best thing is what happened to me. Rather, rather than me resigning and uh, having to face other circumstances, I knew that they would get rid of me. So, so in effect, you are trying to say that the situation that was on the ground at that time was not conducive to normal operations. That's what I said, yeah. You were saying, therefore, you were not at liberty to do the things that you were required to do. And that, that, that I would have loved to do. That you were also required to do. Yes, correct. See, so, in fact, uh, you were saying, why, why were you at liberty? Was it you were afraid something would happen to you? Or were you afraid that you would lose your job? Or you were afraid that they would do anything else other than the two I have mentioned? Any, anything could have happened, anything, without guessing, anything. And, and as a result of that, you did not proceed with what you were supposed to do? Because my sixth sense was telling me all along that I, my, my, term, my term in that office was drawing very, very near to, to come to an end. So you thought, therefore, that the things you were doing was going to land you in trouble? Mm -hmm. Correct. And that is why you did not do the things that you were supposed to do. That, that I would have loved to do. Yes. In fact, your fears came to reality. They happened. I, I don't know whether they are my fears, but what I thought would happen, happened. Which was? I, I, I mean, fortunately, I was retired, not dismissed. But I, I had rumor that I was supposed to have been dismissed. But at the 11th hour, Somebody decided to change their mind, and I was retired. Here is the commission. Tell us, what do you think happened? What do I think happened? In what respect? April 10th. What I... do you think happened? No, that's rather vague. What do you mean? What do you think happened around GTTI and Westfield? What do you think happened? What is your worst guess, best guess as to what happened? No, let me not guess. It's not fair. No further questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, my <coughs> counsel, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. King. Commissioners, if you have any questions, let's go ahead and then get that. Uh, Commissioner Kinte, followed by Commissioner uh, uh, Bishop Modico. Mr. King, uh, to me it looks like uh, you were annoyed of uh, interferences in your area of work that annoyed you and made you become indifferent. Uh, what, what is your take on that? Yes, you are, you are partially right. You are partially right. I was not happy. And uh, what I thought at the very beginning when I was appointed came to pass when I said I didn't want to take the, take the job because of political interference. So that is exactly what happened. You are right. Um, you were vigilant enough. You took it over um, and accepted the appointment. I thought uh, you would have adopted uh, adequate resilience uh, to say, okay, no problem. I knew it will come but I, I will be the victor. Didn't you, didn't you think that way and that uh, you suppressed your emotions and had gone one, two more steps?
to have uh, brought us some of the things. Like, you could have said, withdraw our people if others are interfering. That would have been a better choice than indifference. Yeah, I can see where you are coming from, Commissioner. Yes. But uh, knowing uh, the system that was in place, if I had said to my men, uh, withdraw, come back, don't do this, don't do that, it would have had no effect because who are the people who gave the instructions to, for them to do what they did? The other, po the other, point, the other point is uh, um, to be able to vindicate your people in case they are innocent. No, I don't want to vindicate they, them. No, no, no. Don't, I'm just, don't get I'm, me wrong. No, no, no. I'm just saying in the event that your people, it was not your people, are you sure it was your people who fired? Well, if, if I say I'm sure, that's not a fair statement to make. I'm, I, that's all, why I'm all, asking. All the indications that I'm getting. Well, there are indicators that your people were fire, firing. It, it, that's the PIU it, and... Uh, it would appear that people from the PIU also fired. Oh. I, I don't have proof of that. Yeah, I said uh, you could have gone a little, one more step and that wouldn't have made uh, launch you into any problem to but instead but, help vindicate your but, people but if I may come in here yeah that is all the more why I said to you because I said I was going to go to the bottom of this matter that is why I was out of the job it's a follow-on this thing happened in April the, the the remaining weeks in April I was on this matter May I was on this matter June I was out I don't know where you are seeing where I'm coming from. No, I am. But that means you were indeed determined. I was trying to. I did say it. I, I told you. I said it over the radio. I said it over Focus on Africa. I said I will go to the bottom of this. And it's because I wanted to go to the bottom of this. That is why I ended up the way I did. Thank God. I mean, I, I was retired. But if I... No. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Bishop, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. King, in uh, your testimony, you did testify that it is out of the TRRC that um, certain revolutions have come out. And I'm sure you would agree with me that all of us would see one object in a different light. And uh, with that, is it possible for you to just give us, the Commission, you know, an example of what was abnormal during the year 2000? When you say abnormal, in what sense? Well, um, I guess you were saying that um, you were not operating, you know, in... Uh, a normal condition during those during that year according to what you were saying yes, I don't know exactly what you are focusing on um, you said okay you did mention that everybody knows what happened during those period they were not normal times so I'm saying that if you could give us, you know, an example of what was not normal during that period. Okay. Uh, this, this, the simplest I can recall is the question of people being sacked from their jobs. This was not only gossip. It was talk around town. People will leave their homes to go to work. They are not even sure whether, when they, come, whether they will come home as the way they went to work. You don't know whether you'll be dismissed, or you'll be arrested, or you will this, or you will that. You, the, 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 uh, the question of uh, going to work and working happily, it was not there. My own very de deputy, it happened to him. These 14 uh, boys that I, I was supposed to sack, I'm sorry, I hope I'm not deviating, that I was supposed to sack and I did not sack. When I came back, I said to him, Sankung, I'm just from H.E., is, do you know about instructions to sack 14 people? And he tried to forget. I brought him. He said, oh, yes, 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 sir. I said, I have just been asked to sack them. I told him I wasn't doing it. 
and I gave him the circumstances that led to me saying that. And he said to me, boss, you are right. You are very right. I said, okay. When I was relieved of my duties, barely one month after, I was driving along Westfield uh, roundabout to come to Banjo, and I saw somebody driving a car with this white CMC allergy. I don't know how they call it. It's something like what you are putting on, the white one. And he said to me, boss, 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 and I stopped. He said, look what happened to me. And I said, what? He showed me a letter. He, he was dismissed that day. So I dismissed him in a very nice way. And he said to me, what have I done? I said, ah, you are asking me. Me, I'm no longer in the service. You're asking me. And then I said to him, but, but something, you've been, to, you've been to Mecca twice, man, and then you are making like this for just a job? Hey, boss, you, every time somebody is angry, you cool them down. I said, yes, I'm, I'm supposed to cool you down. Was that pleasant? And these are the very people. I had cause whilst I was in the office to give a verbal instruction. I said, from now, I don't want to hear any, anybody speak certain language in this place. Because everybody was speaking some kind of language. This, my, my minister was this tribe. My deputy was this tribe. My operations was this tribe. My dad was this tribe. And they would be talking. I said, my friend, you think this place is so and so place? From now, speak English or don't talk. Say, hey, so I defend Nyanga League. What Nyanga? No. So the atmosphere was not conducive. If anybody who was in the system and knows what was happening, it's not that I am refusing to talk. No. But there was absolute fear. There was absolute lies. And they planted people in the mosques, in the churches. I have a particular friend who, who, who was a Christian. How did I know that he was an informant? Informant to spy the church? How did I know? Once I was in the office and the DG of NIA called me to say he wanted me to help him with some fuel for one of his operatives. I said, but me, I'm not going to give my fuel to somebody I don't know. He said, I said, if the person wants my fuel because you don't have your coupons yet, you will refund me, you know. He said, yes. I said, let him come to my office. And when the person came, I said, ah, you are an informant. For what? He said, ah, you know, to be spying on the church. Spy church for what? I also knew of a Muslim, my very good, a very good friend of mine, something similar. If it, if it were not for wanting fuel from me in my office, I would never have dreamt that they, they were informants. But why do you have to plant informants in churches, in mosques, in this, in that, so that everybody who is talking, you'll be doing like this? Look, who is, why? You think if people go to work under those circumstances, you call that normal circumstance? So people are afraid even to tell you the truth. Something will happen. You will be interested to know. They will know, but they will not tell you. And afterwards, you're only human. You cannot say something you don't know. You have your CID, you have your special branch, you have your DCU. They are all meant to gather information and feed you. If they don't feed you, how do you know? And it's by the grace of God. People like us used to live here, they say, meeting in so-and-so place. And he says you should come, you will drive how many miles to go to Kanilai for nonsense. For what? For what? And because of, <laughs> I can name names. I have officers here who were in the uh, NIA. They have named me until they said to me, side of the mer, so new if you pass it, do they not go leka leka and be? I don't eat. I don't want to eat. Eat for what? I will go there from morning till midnight. I will not eat. And <laughs> one day I went there again. We were there from morning. They know we are there. Big men like us. You keep you there with, waiting one, two, three hours. You didn't come. I came back home. Yeah. Where is where he? See? They say he went. He didn't ask me why I went back. Why? What's those kinds of treatment? And nobody will talk. I am not saying he did anything to me as an individual. There. Me as a one, on a one-to-one. -one. He did not say anything to me. He just looked at me like this. See? He, and I, I didn't tell you the interesting thing with Sankung about those 14 men that I was telling you. You know, when I learned that he dismissed them, I went to his office. I said, Sankung, I understand that you have sacked those 14 people I told you I will not sack. Hey, boss, you know, Yen Akung Yen. What do you mean, Yen Akung Yen? We are Aku. What, so what? What is the difference between Aku and whatever tribe? So, you can, so if they say go and drive 14 people, you, you dismiss them. And I told you that he had told me and I refused. 
So when, I, when you go through all this, and then you see things are changing, hopefully, hopefully, for the better, and then somebody goes and does nonsense and wants to associate you, don't you get angry? I am angry. I'm not talking about you. It's not you, you know. I'm talking about what happened in the past. <laughs> don't get me wrong. <laughs> of course, I no, understand. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I understand. But I'm happy that you have answered the questions. No, I, I, is, I, I must say. I this must, is what I was no, alluding no, no, to, but, but you but, No, no, but I must say, I just reflected on something. That's why I changed. Because yesterday you told me something. You said to me, I'm going to be hard at you. I forgot you said that. Or that I would have allowed you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted your private conversation <laughs> to stay between the two of you, but that's a uh, all right. No, I'm sorry if uh, I offended you. If, uh, if you have any closing um, uh, stay, um, uh, final remarks to make, please um, uh, proceed to do so. But before that, since we have you here for uh, April 2000, just two questions, um, uh, maybe you can make them part of your closing remarks. And that is, if um, uh, you're going to tell your former colleagues in the police uh, force uh, to learn a lesson from April 2000. What would that lesson be? Secondly, or the second question is, was there any political interference with the operation during the 10th and the 11th of uh, April 2000? But please proceed to make your closing remarks. If you want to answer these two questions somewhere yes, separately, I, I, I you can try. take them. Please me, go ahead. Let, let me start from the last one. If there was any political uh, influence, I cannot swear that there wasn't, because I believe there was. But to prove it may not be too easy. But what I can say nearest to that was by some stroke of luck, I was able to defuse a third incident. I think I, uh, when they were supposed to bury, uh, what's his name, the Red Cross chap, uh, Barry. Baru. Baru, Baru, I beg your pardon. What some people don't realize is, growing up, I was uh, a cop and a scout member of the Red Cross until I became assistant secretary and uh, ended up where I ended up. So I know the values of all these institutions. So I will be the last person to injure anybody working in, uh, in those disciplines. I'll be the last. I am saying so because when they were going to uh, bury uh, Barrow, I was in the office fortunately and then I got a call. IG, IG, I said yes please. That, that procession, the funeral of uh, Baru, stop it. I said, who's that speaking? And he told me who he was. I said, I am not stopping any procession. I'm not stopping any procession and don't interfere anymore in police operations. Because when they were going to bury uh, Baru, I gave them clear court instructions in the passing of the CMC um, uh, Baji. Landing Baji. I said to him, during the funeral of Barrow, make sure that no police officer goes anywhere near them in uniform. I said, I don't mind you attending the funeral. I don't mind you going as members of the force, as CID officers. And don't congregate. You can mix with the crowd. But I don't want to see any single person in uniform. I got that kind of uh, idea during my trips to Singapore. And people who have been to Singapore will know that you can hardly go to Singapore and see a policeman in uniform in the streets. And there are police officers all around the place. Because I knew that if they had stopped that procession, Mr. Chair, with all due respect to you, what do you think would have happened? Trying to stop that, that procession. And he just closed the phone and that was the end of the matter. After the funeral, Vaji came back to report to me. I said, yes, how was the funeral? Oh, boss, the time when you were talking to me, even we were in the compound putting monies in those, that, the thing that they put for funerals, putting monies there. So where do they get their source of information from? And that simple, simple, simple statement 
could have caused, it, could have caused trouble. Can you imagine if the police went there and said they were stopping that funeral procession? For what? For what? And then it would have been a police problem again. So yes, there was interference. And what, what, what was the second question, sir? You asked me a second question. Yes. What was it? Yes. The first thing, not only my colleagues to learn from, I think the first thing that one has to learn from this is in any establishment is to avoid tribal selection. Where you have it, a place, you have five maningos, ten maningos against, you are looking for trouble. You are looking for trouble. And it's good to be truthful. One distinction that I can make between the fire services and the police is that in the fire service world, you live as a family. In the police world, everybody's an enemy. That's, that was my experience. And unless there is that element of love, you can all have your different ideas. Promotion, you, you cannot take more than your luck. What is your luck is your luck as far as I'm concerned. But if you want to say it's all for self and none for others, you're only looking for trouble. So me, I'm saying to colleagues, me, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am a service person born and I probably will die like that. that that's my passion. I like, I like working in services. I like helping. Me, I'm humanitarian based. I like to help. Yes, but I am a great disciplinarian. I like to go straight. I don't, I don't, I don't like telling lies. If you want me to get angry only, push me into lies, I will get angry. I don't like lies. I prefer to die than to tell a lie. So my humble advice is to my colleagues is that love each other, work as a team, share information, be honest, and don't worship anybody. You are employed by the state. That was one weakness we had in the system. It was like working for Yaya Jame. You don't work for Yaya Jame. You're working for the Gambia. It will interest the commission to know that after I had retired, I was written to appointed to some office. But I wrote a very nice letter. A very nice letter declining it. When I retired, I was appointed as the director of refugee and emergency services in, as, as an impl implementing partner for UNHCR in charge of Sierra Leone, Liberia, Somalia, blah, 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 blah until they applied the cessation clause. And when they applied it, they wanted me to take the refugees from Casamas. I said, no, I don't want to work anymore. That is my passion. I like to help. But one has to be honest. And if you want to get me angry, just tell me lies. I'll, I'll fall out with you. It doesn't matter who you are. And, and this question of being afraid, if anybody thinks that me, I'm a coward, you are making yourself a fool. Me, I'm not a coward. I am not a coward, underline. I can avoid trouble, I can see trouble coming, I, I you know, but to say that, oh, I am afraid, I, I don't know what is that. Those who know me in this, my bomb disposal thing, they know, I was in Ireland. It was there that I stopped being afraid of dead people. I used to jump over cops every day, three, four, five, ten cops. It was then I realized that dead men don't bite. Before I went there, I used to be afraid if I see a dead body lying down, I will go miles away. Now I can go to the mortuary any time, day or night. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I thank the commission for having, given, having patience. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, just uh, one little point. Uh, beautiful speech, uh, but one question, one issue left unsaid. Who made the call? <laughs> If I tell you something, you will not believe it. If I tell you something, yes. you will not believe it. I was Who? expecting you to say so all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's the big elephant in the room. Who made that yeah, telephone yeah, call? It's my, it's my former minister. Who was the person you told, don't interfere with police operations? It's my former minister. He's my friend now. He's my friend. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Mr. King. And uh, for us to take um, uh, two hours and the 45 minutes of your time, come and testify 
on a very difficult Tama issue. Uh, 22 years would haunt the country, but uh, April 2000 would do so very much and would be very prominent in that haunting of the country. Again, thank you enormously for coming to uh, share uh, your views with us. And uh, if I heard your response to the council at the beginning of the testimony about your uh, personal profile to uh, have you here, keep you all this time on the eve of your birthday, <laughs> something. But we will we all join your family and friends to wish you a very happy birthday tomorrow. Thank you very much. And I thank you again for coming to the commission to assist us in carrying out our mandate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tomorrow we meet again at 10 o'clock sharp. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.